Hi, my name is Rabbi Pini Duna. Welcome to my weekly Erev Shabbos Torah this week for Parshas Vayakhel. If you've ever done management training, you'll know that as part of the training, they tell the apocryphal story of a salesman who walks into his manager's office one day for a chat. The sales manager decides to use the meeting as a sales education opportunity. And he proceeds to educate the salesman on the most effective sales technique. The main thing to remember, he advises the salesman, is repetition, repetition, repetition. If you have a product to sell, keep mentioning it in every possible way until it feels like you're cramming it down people's throats and beating them over the head with it. You must repeat and repeat and repeat. It's the only way to get results. Yes, sir, answers the salesman. Okay, great. Um, And what was it you came to see me about? The salesman replies, a raise, a raise, a raise, a raise, a raise, a raise. It's funny, right? But if you look at the final chapters of Sefer Shmois, the book of Exodus, do you know what you'll see? Endless repetition. How do we explain it? First, there's the detailed instructions for the construction of the Mishkan. And then there's the actual construction of the Mishkan. And they're identical, a straight up copy and paste job. Actually, the truth is, this depiction of the repetition is not quite accurate. Although the differences are limited differences, almost imperceptible, the differences that exist are important and meaningful. Let me illustrate with a story which can help us understand why differences can be significant, even if they're very small. Some years ago, when I was still a rabbi in London, a man from the community I lived in visited me at my office. He was involved in some kind of financial dispute with another Jewish man, and he wanted me to recommend to him a Beit Din to hear the case. I didn't know the man too well and was a little surprised that he was coming to see me. I asked him which synagogue he actually belonged to, and he told me. I was puzzled because there's a Beit Din that's associated with that synagogue. Why are you not going to that Beit Din? I asked him. The man told me that he had considered that Beit Din but wanted to see it in action first and had asked to attend a hearing before he committed to have his own dispute adjudicated there. What he had seen had convinced him that he would not get a fair result in that setting, which was why he was coming to see me. What do you mean? I asked him. He told me the case he went to see was a financial dispute, not dissimilar to his own current dispute. And it began with one of the litigants presenting his side of the story to the three Dayanim. After he was done, the opposing litigant began presenting his side. But as he was doing so, he noticed that one of the three rabbis, the Dayanim, was chatting to another Dayan, one of his colleagues. Hey, excuse me, he said. I'm presenting my side of the story. Why aren't you listening? What for? the Dayan replied. I just heard the story from the other guy. Why do I need to hear it twice? Crazy story, right? And it crystallizes something for us. No two depictions of any scenario are ever identical. That is the whole point. And if there is any purpose in the repetition of the chapters dealing with the Mishkan at the end of Exodus, it is not in the bits which are the same. It is in the bits which are different. Let me share one of those differences with you, and you'll see exactly what I mean. In the portion of Terumah, after having introduced Moshe to the Mishkan, God instructs him regarding the Aron Habrit, the Ark of the Covenant. V'asu Aron atzei shitim, says God, and they shall make an Ark of Acacia wood. The Midrash makes an interesting observation about this Pasuk. Why is it, asks the Midrash, that with all the other temple vessels, the instruction is v'asisa, and you shall make. And with the ark it says v'asu, and they shall make. The answer, says Rabbi Yehuda ben Rabbi Shalom, is that God was saying to Moshe, when it comes to the ark, let them all come and involve themselves with its construction so that they shall all merit the Torah. With all the other vessels of the Mishkan, the instruction was personalized, individualized, v'asisa, You shall make the menorah. You shall make the shulchan. You shall make the mizbeach. But when it came to the Ark of the Covenant, the language was pluralized, generalized, v'asu, and they shall make. This was because of what the Aaron contained. It contained the two sets of luchot, the tablets, and later on, a fully written Torah scroll, which is the source of our Judaism, of our eternity. That's why when constructing the Aaron, Everyone needed to be involved, not just one individual artisan. 
We all have a stake in the Aron, in the Ark, in the Torah, in making sure that it is at the center of Jewish life and at the forefront of our hearts. You cannot leave that up to some lone guy in a workshop. And by the way, this idea translate, translates itself to a community of Torah. Everyone needs to be involved. A community does not belong to one individual or even to a collection of individuals, each marching on their own to their own beat. It belongs to all of its stakeholders collectively, united in purpose, in lockstep with each other, making sure that the Ark of the Covenant is the sacred center of the community and that we are all together collectively bringing the message of Torah to the world, perpetuating it and strengthening it. Okay, well, if that's the case, one would expect that when the Ark was finally made and its construction was recorded in Vayakhel, the wording would be, and they made the Ark of the Covenant. Well, if that's what you thought, you'd be wrong. Because when we finally reach the chapter that describes the making of the Ark, it says, Vayas B'Tzalel Es Ha'aron. B'Tzalel made the Ark. One person, B'Tzalel, he made it, no one else. What? Didn't we just say that this was exactly what God didn't want? He made very clear that he did not want the ark to be individualized as it represents the Torah, which needs to be a joint effort of all the Jews. Good question, right? Well, I'm going to share an answer from Rav Baruch Sorotskin, Zichron Lelivracha, Rosh Hashiva of Tells Cleveland. And let me introduce his answer with a little Chelm story. One year, the community of Chelm announced a wine appeal. Every member was asked to contribute a cup of Kiddush wine for the shul to use for Kiddush and Havdolah each week during the following year. A barrel was passed around the community, taken to each member's house, and each member was asked to pour a cup of wine into the barrel. Or at least, that was the idea. But each person thought to themselves, mm, there's a couple of hundred members in our community, so instead of wine, I'll pour water with 199 cups of wine, who's ever going to know? Eventually, the synagogue got the barrel back and the first week of the new year arrived. That Friday night, the Shamus opened the barrel and discovered that the entire thing was filled with water. <laughs> Rabbi Sarotskin suggests that when it comes to communal efforts, we all rely on the fact that someone else will take care of it. It's not really me that needs to do anything, we say to ourselves, as it will almost certainly get taken care of by someone else. Someone else will come to Minyan. Someone else will attend the Shir. Someone else will host Shabbos guests. Someone else will worry about what needs to get done for the community. But in the end, do you know what that means? That the community barrel is filled with water, not wine. But Salol knew it had to be everybody who made the Ark, but he devoted himself to making the Aron as if no one else was doing it. And as the lead artisan, he was the example for everyone else to follow and not the excuse for everyone else not to do it. My friends, we are a community, but we must never be slack or lazy because there are others doing the job. We must go ahead and do everything that we can for the community as if there is no one else doing it. That's how community really works. And with that, let me wish you Shabbat Shalom. Thank you so much for watching. Good Shabbos, good Shabbos.